Hello and welcome. We're going to continue our look at the scriptures and today we start 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is could be called the reign of King David because this this book of the Bible tells us about David when he's king of Israel. And one thing beautiful about the Bible is the honesty. We're going to hear good things about David, and we're going to hear bad things about David. And the Bible's that way. The Bible does not cover up or try to put a sweet picture on everything. Oh, here's a man of God. He's a godly man. So we're not going to tell you anything bad that he did. We want you to think about him being so good. Same with Moses. You know, we, if you're going to be in the spotlight for Jesus, you need to be transparent. We are all sinners. We've fallen short of the glory of God. We have rebelled against him. We have acted selfishly. And it doesn't matter who you are as a leader. We are guilty. We're all guilty. Only Jesus was holy and pure and, and perfect. So we're going to hear about David and the ups and downs of David's life. Now, to begin our look at 2 Samuel, I need to kind of review the last chapter of 1 Samuel. Because in the last chapter of 1 Samuel, Saul dies. He's in a battle with the Philistines. He gets wounded. He tells his armor bearer, or asks his armor bearer, kill me. I don't want the Philistines to kill me. Please kill me. And the armor bearer basically has the mentality of David, I cannot strike the Lord's anointed. I can't do that. And so Saul falls on his sword and kills himself. David, meanwhile, is far away. And we see in the very first chapter of 2 Samuel that David's loyalty even his love for Saul is genuine. Because this guy comes running up to David, says, oh, I've got great news for you, great news. Saul is dead. In fact, I have brought you, uh, where is this? Do, 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 do. Yeah, here it is in chapter 1, verse 10. I took the crown which was on his head, the bracelet which was on his arm, and I brought him here to you, my Lord. And David says, how do you really know he's dead? And so I guess this messenger was hiding on the hill or something or escaped the battle because he said Saul was wounded. He was wounded. And he asked me to kill him. Well, he asked his armor bearer to kill him. And I'm not sure this was the armor bearer. And so I did. I saw, saw, I saw <laughs> that Saul was wounded. He asked me to kill him, so I struck him and I killed him, and so I brought this to you. And David basically says, how could you strike the Lord's anointed? Now the guy lied. Saul died by his own hand, but this fellow wanted to be a, a hero to David. He wanted to get on David's good side. See, I have killed your enemy for you, and I'll get to that in a few minutes about the enemy of David. So David, though, took hold of his clothes. He tore his clothes. They did that a lot in the, in the Bible, and I'm not sure what that means. We don't tear our clothes today when we're in anguish. At least I haven't seen anybody do it or haven't heard anybody talking about it. And David's loyalty is genuine. First of all, he has this guy that brings him this good news killed. How could you do that? And he tells his people, strike him down. Boom. And so the guy's been killed. David kills the guy who brings him the news saying that he had killed Saul. And then David chanted with a lament over Saul and also Jonathan, his son. And he says in verse 17 and 18, Your beauty, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How have the mighty fallen? And he's genuinely grief-stricken because Saul is dead. That means David's loyalty to him is real. Well then, anyway, he's made king over Judah. The Lord tells him to go to Hebron, which he does. And then a fellow by the name of ish Bosheth, I may have mispronounced that, sorry. He's the son of Saul, and he's made king over Israel. And the Bible's pretty specific here. It's interesting. 
that they made him king over this area, this area. They mentioned Ephraim specifically. Now, this Ishbahish, <laughs> the new king, is a son of Saul who's from the tribe of Benjamin. But it specifically says he's king over Ephraim. Now, that is a tribe of Joseph. David, meanwhile, from the tribe of Judah, is king over Judah. And so, again, we see the connection and rivalry between Joseph and Judah. So that's made here again. Now, David is the king of Judah for seven and a half years. And we now learn about Joab. I think we may have heard his name before. But Joab, they said, is the son of Zeruah. And Zeruah is David's sister. And I believe, I haven't done this calculation, I saw one time on a, on a quiz thing, uh, what woman is mentioned more than any other in the Bible? And I said, Zeruah. Well, it wasn't even in the, the multiple choice. I go, yes, she is. She's the sister of David, a woman, and the mother of Joash, Joab, mother of Joab. And constantly, the Bible says Joab, the son of Zeruah. Zeruah. <laughs> And so Zeruah is a woman's name. We, never, we don't know anything about her except that she's the sister of David and the mother of three sons that were in David's army. But her, her name is mentioned over and over and over again, which means when we hear about Joab, he's David's nephew. Now, because of the age difference, Joab could be close to the same age as David because David was the youngest son. And so... Um, his sister could have been a lot older, had a, had her boys and and uh, so forth. So we don't we don't know if Joab's that much younger, if he's even younger at all, David. Now, like I said, Ishboish is now the king of Israel, and he's made some enemies himself. You know, it's a very shaky kingdom, and he has a problem with a guy named Abner. Abner. Is the, king, is the head of the army in Israel. And Abner's not the best guy either because he goes into Saul's concubine and uh, has relations with her. And, and the king, uh, Ishboish, gets on him. How can you do that? You're, you shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. You know, that's not right. And go into my father's concubine. And, and Abner gets all upset and says, well, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I don't have to put up with you. I can go and be a, be a general in David's army. David will be glad to have me. And in the process of this, all that's going on, there were some bad guys in Israel, and they decided to kill Ishboish, and they did. They killed him, cut off his head, and brings it to David. And there's something really interesting here in chapter 4 and verse 8. They bring the head of Ishboish to David at Hebron and said to him, Behold, the head of the son of Saul, your enemy. Behold, this is, this, this is the head of your enemy. Thus the Lord has given my Lord the king vengeance on this day on Saul and his descendants. Who is the enemy of David? Not Saul, not Saul's son. The enemy of David is the same enemy you have and I have, and that's the devil and his host of demons. There are enemies. The Bible tells us we do not fight against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. David knew this. And, and he, again, got angry at the guys. He said, see, we brought you the head of your enemy. No, he's, he's not my enemy. You are. <laughs> you put your hand on the Lord's anointed, and he had them killed. <laughs> so don't go to David with good news saying that his enemies are dead because he knows who his real enemy is. So um, that's, that's just not good to do right there. Okay, now let's move on a little further. In chapter 6, there's a... the. David is in the process now since he's now moving to Jerusalem because he spent seven and a half years as king of Judah. 
and in another 33 years is king over the United Kingdom uh, in Jerusalem of, of all of the, the kingdom of God. By the way, to back up a little bit, when Saul died, you see the division between the northern tribes and the southern tribes with David and Saul's family ruling two different kingdoms. But when Saul's son dies, they're now united. So when we see in the future, when, when um, Solomon's son becomes king and there's a division, there's precedent for that. There's still differences between the northern part and the southern part. And, and then under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, they actually split and become two actual countries again for good, at least more permanently. Okay. So David is in the process of moving the ark into Jerusalem. And he didn't really follow the customs. The ark's on a cart. It's starting to get a little funny. And a man named Uzzah, he, now he did wrong here. It makes it sound like, oh, he was just trying to be helpful. But the law is very clear. The ark is only to be handled by the Levites. But they've got this cart going, and he wanted to be close to the ark, and it, it, start, it hits a rock or something and starts to spill. He reaches out, I get, to, and I know what he's thinking. I can touch the ark now. I will help the ark. And he touches it to balance it. Boom, he's struck dead because the ark is holy. And God said, only the Levites. And so, whoa, everybody, he's, struck, he's stuck dead. And everybody got, whoa, what's going on here? He's dead. We've got to stop this thing. They put the ark in the, in the home of a family, and that family started getting blessed. But somebody, somewhere, King David or somebody, went back to the drawing board, went back to the teachings of Moses, and found out only the Levites could touch the ark and carry the ark. So they came back a few months later and did it properly. And so... Uh, the ark is now handled right and brought into Jerusalem. Now, one last point in uh, chapter 6 and verse 23, David is, or in chapter 6, David is, they're marching the ark into Jerusalem, and David's going out, and he's having a fun time. He, they're worshiping the Lord and bringing the ark in and giving praises to the Lord and, and glorifying him, and he's dancing in the street. And after the festivities are over, he goes home, and his wife, Michael, who's the daughter of, of Saul, is saying, well, boy, you really distinguished yourself. You're out there in, your, in a little um, ephod, a little uh, garment where you have a, this thing wrapped around your, your waist. And you're out there, you know, shouting and jumping around and dancing. And, and it was an embarrassment to me, to Michael. Michael was embarrassed looking at her husband doing that. And David pretty much said, well, I did it for the Lord, and I'm not going to hear your criticism. Then the Bible says something interesting in chapter 6 and verse 23. As it says, I'm getting ahead of myself, it said, Michael, the daughter, he put her away. You know, David put her away. And uh, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. And I cannot help but think that's a good thing. Because can you imagine a man whose father is David, whose grandfather is Saul, and when David dies, he could really round up a whole lot of people to support him in a rebellion for him to be king. I've got Saul, remember him? He's the first king. He's my grandfather. David, we all lo know and love David. He's my father, therefore I am the rightful king. And even though God had a had anointed Solomon to be king when David died, whoever would have been a son of Michael would have really caused problems. So she was not allowed to have children. And that's just another little, little look at the scriptures. That's what I try to do in this video series, share with you some of my thoughts. I skip over a lot of things. And if you have questions about it or wonder why did I skip it over, you know, make some comments, that's fine. I do not get paid anything by YouTube for doing these. I'm not in it for the money. I just want to share. If you want to subscribe, that'd be neat. I've got, uh, I think, 19 people right now that said they've subscribed to my channel. I'm going, wow, 19 people. But I don't get paid for it. Don't have to uh, subscribe. But I hope you enjoy in getting something out of the videos. Please watch as many as you can. Again, I welcome your comments. And, and Lord Jesus, I ask that you bless everyone who watches these videos, watches this one. Help us today. 
Help us to be filled with your spirit, empowered with your spirit, to have a proper understanding of how to live as a Christian. And I pray that you'll lead all of us to sources that will help us to do just that so we can live in a way that's more pleasing to you as time goes on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.